as I've said several times, some of you have heard the same phrase, welcome back to the Institute. We're delighted to have you here in person. And I welcome those people who are also tuned in by Zoom. One of my favorite museums is the National Archaeological Museum in Naples, which is where many of the real treasures excavated in Pompeii and Herculaneum are lovingly displayed. When my husband took his sisters back to Naples a few years ago, I insisted he had to take them to the museum and obediently he did. On arriving, my sister-in-law had an urgent call and asked the first guard she saw for directions to the bathroom. Dove il gabinetto? Smiling knowingly, I said, Rebecca knows where this is going. The guard gave her very precise directions to the next floor. She raced upstairs to the specified location, walked into this gabinetto segreto, or secret cabinet, and found herself in the museum's collection of all the pornographic art that excavators had found in Pompeii. This is not the Pompeii she remembered from her college art textbooks. After she found an ordinary gabinetto or bathroom, she hurried back to the unexpected trove in the secret one to give it careful study. Pompeii continues to amaze, its secrets continue to titillate, and scholars continue to study it. Even after 250 years, much of the city is still being excavated, yielding new discoveries for scholars to analyze. And our speaker this evening is one of the most thrilling younger scholars studying and analyzing what this very ancient site reveals. Once again, how surprisingly modern was the world of ancient Rome. Rebecca Benefiel is probably a bit too young to have heard the bard sing, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls. Yet Paul Simon's appreciation of graffiti very much foreshadows Dr. Benefield's own investigations. A cultural historian of the Roman world, she has taken a year's leave from Washington and Lee University where she is professor and department chair in the Department of Classics to work here at the Institute on a book about the widespread popularity of writing in first century Pompeii. Not the writing of establishment poets and literati, but the writing of all social classes. The graffiti scrawled on town walls, miraculously preserved by Vesuvius for us today to understand the social environments of the Roman world. The graffiti of Pompeii could be political, they could be personal, they might even be pornographic but they give us a far more textured understanding of how people lived than we get by reading the elegant works of Virgil, of Ovid, or of Seneca. Rebecca is singularly prepared for this fresh and specialized exploration of all that Pompeii has to offer. She earned her BA with highest distinction in Greek and Latin at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, then took her doctorate in what is surely the most ancient classics department in North America at Harvard University. She won the Rome Prize while still a graduate student. And in 2011, she was honored with the Outstanding Faculty Award from the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. She has been a nat national lecturer at the Archaeological Institute of America and president of the American Society of Greek and Latin epigraphy. Professor Benefiel is more than a brilliant scholar. She is, as measured by students' ratings of their professors at Washington and Lee University, an awesome teacher. <laughs> Consistently earning perfect scores from the hardest graders anywhere in the world, undergraduates. She draws kudos as caring, accessible, and respected. We are surely in for an awesome ride tonight, back to a time that in so many ways mirrors our own. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend her your ears.
Thank you so much. I could sit here and listen to you speak for all the whole evening. No, and Paul Simon and um, I love all classics. So I'm. <laughs> Uh, but thank you very much for having me tonight. It is such a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. For the last decade, I've been documenting ancient handwritten inscriptions in Pompeii and Herculaneum, working on the very small pieces, putting them together, making sure that we have accurate material on which to work. And so this year, to really take a step back and put it all together is, um, I'm just very, very, very happy to be here. So thank you to the friends for this invitation. Um, I also love talking about Pompeii, so I hope you'll love hearing about it. And um, if you want to get up in the back, there is a handout just because no one should go home empty handed, but also because um, if you want to explore more of Pompeii after this, at the end, I have some, some resources that allow you these days to get pretty far on your own into kind of any, any building you want in Pompeii. It's really neat. So here we go. Oh, this is what I need. All right. Pompeii and Herculaneum, there we go, um, offer an extraordinary window into the ancient world. And that's, of course, because of the volcano. So as we know, in the year 79, Mount Vesuvius erupted and devastated the surrounding regions. Volcanic debris rained down for two days and buried nearby areas to a depth of 10 meters or more. The Roman emperor afterwards sent a team to evaluate the situation, but the cities in, of Pompeii and Herculaneum were deemed a total loss and were abandoned. Ancient Pompeii has captivated visitors for all that it can show about daily life in the Roman empire the roads people walked, the houses they lived in, the shrines where they left offering to their household gods. But Pompeii is also uniquely situated, as you've already heard, um, to reveal non-literary engagement with writing and reading, thanks to its exceptional preservation. Pompeii has yielded public inscriptions, the monumental te texts on marble and stone that thanks to their durability, have survived for centuries and have been found across the Roman Empire. And here, just to give you a little sense, sense of what we're finding, we have a pair of brothers who is hosting a, and paying for a, a dinner for the leading men of town in Herculaneum. And then we have Eumachia, who's um, putting up a, a massive building uh, for the benefit of the public in Pompeii in her name and in the name, name of her son. In addition to stone inscriptions, however, Pompeii is unique for preserving scores of writings in less permanent media. Here we have Dipinti. These are the painted inscriptions that are put up by professionals with specific equipment. So they have ladders, they have paint brushes. Um, uh, their inscriptions have a standard paleography. They're putting up notices for public interest and they're being paid for it. Um, and that is how we have um, the ability to study local politics generation after generation in Pompeii. There's nowhere else that we have that depth of material. But there's one more class of inscriptions that is less well known, and these are what are called graffiti. Um, this term graffiti was coined as an adjective in the mid 1800s as archaeological excavations were progressing in both Rome and Pompeii. And the excavators kept finding these little scratches, scratches on the wall. And so they eventually called it the scratched inscriptions, iscrizione graffite. Over the course of the 20th century, of course, in English speaking um, locations, the word graffiti has expanded to be any writing on a wall. But in Italy, there's still a difference between dipinti and graffiti. So graffiti is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, because for graffiti, you need no specialized equipment, you just need a sharp implement that could be a stylus that you usually use on your wax tablet, or it could be a, a fibula that pins your cloak together. Um, but you just need that and a thought, a desire to write something. So these wall inscriptions provide a glimpse into the everyday ephemeral writing that would eventually be plastered over or fade away. And it's only thanks to Pompeii that we can determine how very much text was integrated into the urban fabric of an ancient city. Were it not for this site, 
we would never guess that one city could hold 11,000 pieces of individual writing on its walls as Pompeii did when the volcano erupted. So for the rest of this talk, we'll be focusing on how these handwritten inscriptions illustrate the production of writing by the general population in the first century, not through any official channel. And um, if you have the handout, you've already figured out what this says, but this is Augusto Feliciter. We don't have, in, in our culture, we don't have an equivalent expression. The, the most literal way to say it is happily for the emperor. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a positive wish that we find again and again in Pompeii, happily for this person, happily for that person, happily for all the dry cleaners, happily <laughs> for the innkeeper. Um, and, and so um, already kind of just by charting out this one expression, we, that is repeated and directed towards varied re recipients, women, men, groups. Um, we can see shared communication strategies and we can point specifically to a culture of positive expression. However, as you can also see, this is, this is much um, larger than in real life. It's about two centimeters high, um, the, the lettering. Um, but as you can see, it's difficult to capture ancient graffiti and photographs. And in fact, we have very little illustration of graffiti at all. So we're lucky when we have a line drawing like this, and I show you this one because it's also fabulous. If you can, you can probably, you can read it. Even if you don't read Latin, you can read it, right? Let's do this. Labyrinthus, hic, hic, here, habitat, lives, the min, o taurus. Um, so the minotaur, that is great. Um, the graffiti show us a wide variety of content, um, personal names, quotations of literature, greetings among friends, prayers to the gods, even drawings. These messages were as individualized and unique as the people who wrote them. But before we jump into the meat of these writings themselves, it's important to understand some of the challenges working with this material. So first, it's handwriting. There's the spontaneous nature of casual writing. So we get handwriting like that, that might be Latin. Um, and then we get abbreviations and inside jokes where may, I know that this guy is making a joke. Um, SC would be on Roman coins. So he's saying that he stayed alone because of a, a senatorial law. It's not, it's a joke. It's probably something it wouldn't have ended up in the Gabinetto Segreto, but there might be that behind it. Um, so these are, these are brief. They're in no way standardized like the Dipinti, um, and they don't undergo any editing before they take form. Plus, we've got the fragile surfaces that held ancient graffiti now have weathered, they've been scratched against, and they were never intended to survive multiple centuries. Then we have our good fortune that we have this. 120 city blocks have been excavated so far. And so we have a lot of material and it's been excavated over more than two centuries, which of course means we've got a legacy of varying documentation um, and that can make things difficult as well. But the real challenge I think to understanding what ancient graffiti are and what they can tell us about the ancient world is unfortunately ourselves and modern assumptions. Because when I say graffiti, you think something. And even though graffiti was a term that was coined to talk about these ancient scratched writings, we have graffiti in our lives now that means something else. So um, here we go. Um, the influential Roman archeologist August now pronounced this in his best-selling book, Pompeii, its life and art. You can see taken as a whole, the graffiti are less fertile for our knowledge of Pompeian life than might have been expected. The people with whom we most eagerly desired to come into contact, the cultivated men and women of the ancient city were not accustomed to scratch their names on the wall. 
Um, for the rest, we may assume that the writers were as little representative of the best elements of society as are modern tourists who scratch or carve their names on ancient monuments today. So he's not really upset about what people are writing. He's upset about who's writing. Um, but he was incredibly influential. And so this, um, this pronouncement effectively shut down scholarship on ancient graffiti for a century, a century. There was virtually no scholarly output for the 1900s. In the 1990s, thankfully, Antonio Verone came along. He would eventually become director of the excavations, and he revived the field with his study of erotic graffiti in Pompeii, which is great because then I don't have to do it. Um, <laughs> But it's really only in the last two decades that scholarship has picked up and really taken off in the field. So we have Christina Milner's work on the literary graffiti, Sarah Levin Richardson's work, scholarship on gender in Pompeii, and my own research analyzing graffiti in their archaeological context and in dialogue with each other. Some of us are introducing new approaches and, and other scholars now joining the discussion and the field is receiving more attention than ever and just to show you how far the field has come. <laughs> Ancient graffiti even had their own moment of going viral a couple of years ago. And that's because the director of the park was using Instagram. Um, so, so as excavations are, are, are moving along, they found a graffito. It was charcoal. Um, we could talk about it. It's really fun. We don't know exactly what it entirely says, but we get headlines like this that even made it into CNN and ABC News and Daily Mail. Everything's changed because of a graffito in Pompeii, which is fantastic. So it's, 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 a, it's a great time to be studying ancient graffiti. So tonight, I'm going to introduce you to, to my approach um, to studying these texts and ex explain how we're shifting the playing field. Because ancient graffiti have traditionally been documented and presented as text. And they certainly are text. But when we look at graffiti as typed words on a page, there's this tendency to expect them to be the type of Latin that we study in the classroom. And sometimes we do find texts just like that of Roman authors. Here we have one. But if we stop at this point and simply focus on the content of a message, we miss out on the physicality and the engagement of ancient graffiti. If instead we have the chance to examine ancient graffiti as both text and as artifact, we come away with a richer understanding of this as communication. These messages were written by hand, they had some sort of visual impact, and they became part of a physical environment. So it's often impossible to reconstruct that environment at this remove, but that's why I've been doing the, the field work for the past decade, and it's my motivation for creating the Ancient Graffiti Project, which I'll show you at the very end. So I'm going to be illustrating as much as I can tonight to get us away from thinking about a, a page. So let's head on a small tour of Pompeii for this evening. Uh, we'll, we'll start out with ancient graffiti posted in public spaces. We have the Basilica down at the bottom left, um, and the theater district kind of in the bottom center. We'll consider to what extent these writings communicated to an audience in public spaces. Then we'll turn to the non-public spaces where messages would have reached many fewer readers and consider what we find inside Pompeian houses. At that point, if you want, we can also come back to Mao's assumption that elites would not have participated in this form of communication. And then finally, if we have time, I'm just gonna give you a brief little intro to the Ancient Graffiti Project and how you can explore more about graffiti if you want to. But let's start in the Basilica or the law courts. The, Basilis, the Basilica served as the law court for the city of Pompeii with a raised tribunal at the far end where a judge would sit to hear cases. This was a central, important building of nearly every Roman town and it always stood in the city center as it does here on Pompeii's forum. This was a spacious, multifunctional building that also offered Pompeians a place to stroll in the shade or to conduct business. And it provided a surface upon which to write vis-a-vis -vis its walls, because at the time of the eruption, it featured more than 200 graffiti written inside the basilica. One of these texts is a very simple message of greetings to a friend. 
Roman greetings often include the names of both the writer and the recipient publicizing the bonds of the relationship. So it's not just, hi, Katie. Um, it's Rebecca says hi to Katie. This class of graffito, more than any other, echoes the speech of first century Pompeii and reflects developments in spoken Latin that we might not otherwise be able to identify. So if any of you are in Latin class now, um, you walk in and what do you say to your teacher? Or if you remember back to your Latin class, everyone together, salve, good job. That's not the cool way to say hi in Pompeii anymore. That's just the way you talk to your teacher. Um, as we can see here, it's just sal and it's sal and then maybe salute him, but don't ever say that M, that's not cool. We're already moving into the romance languages people in the first century. So salute him is becoming navalized and now it's salute and then it's just sal. Wale is the same thing, it's just wa. So you can think about hello, hi, but, but in Pompeii, this is what they're saying. We get that they're saying sal. Um, so now take just a moment and think about how you imagine the simple high would appear. Like, how would you just write it on the wall? Got it in your head? Okay. Does it look like this? Probably not, right? Probably not. Um, it's surprising that we can really see there's a distinctly careful attention paid by the writer to making the text legible to the reader. So we have kind of very clear letters with these beautiful up and down strokes. Uh, we have kind of a guiding line and we even have serifs on some of the letters if you, can, if you can get close enough to see them. So this is definitely a showpiece. This is not just a, a spray painted sort of thing. It's a showpiece in the basilica that's linking the two of them. Um, and in fact, we get a, 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 a subsequent writing back from alchemist to Pyrrhicus, but alchemist couldn't write himself. So someone else wrote it for him. But we'd have no idea of the appearance and the visual communication of this inscription had there not been the decision in 1841 to cut large panels of plaster out of the wall of the basilica and transfer them to the Royal Archaeological Museum in Naples for safekeeping, thank goodness. So we can now see them because of course they would have disappeared um, within about 20 years um, had they not been removed. So when you visit the Basilica today, you can still see the holes on the wall where these gigantic pieces were transferred and the, the panels are there. That's what they look like. They were put on wooden backing and are incredibly heavy. Um, so another, a second theme that we find among graffiti is poetry and quotation of literature. And one of the most clever compositions is here in the Basilica where we find a writer combined an elegiac couplet from the poet Ovid's Amores with a second elegiac couplet written by the poet Propertius on the same theme, the exclusus amator, the lover who's been shut out and can't get into his, his to see his girlfriend that evening. Um, but as I've noted, this isn't just poetry, it's handwritten poetry. And when we have the chance to view it as an ancient reader would, we see so much more. So the text, again, is written with very careful attention, communicating the metrical nature of the inscription. So the long lines, the first and the third line are hexameters, and the pentameters, the second and fourth, are indented. And immediately that tells you elegiac couplet. It tells you not just poetry, but it tells you what the meter is. We also have these, these um, flourishes for the initial letters to really zhuzh it up, um, and we have interpunks, and you can see that this handwriting, even if you can't read it, you can see that this handwriting is different from the all capitals that we had of the greeting or of the Augusto Felicitere at the beginning, right? So poetry, you write in cursive, you make it flowing, um, and that's what we see with this poetry. Um, the complementary juxtaposition of, two, of poetry from two different authors led to a series where others added their contribution. So below we get someone else writing and quoting Ovid from a different piece of his work with, with one of my favorite um, kind of statements of all time. Um, but here we can see poetic recall in action. 
because the line should say what's harder than rock, what's softer than wave, but um, you know, nevertheless, hard rocks are hollowed out by soft water. Um, and what we have instead is at the beginning, this writer is saying, what can be so hard than a rock? What is softer than water? And then he gets the second line perfect because the pentameter of the second line is dun da da dun da da dun dun da da dun da da dun. And so it's really easy to remember that second line. Um, and so he has that just fine. But it's really another delightful reference to literature and circulation at the time, even if the Emperor Augustus had banished Ovid um, and had ordered his books removed from the public libraries. He lives on in his fans. Um, so this series continues. Um, and at a certain point, it seems one writer maybe had enough poetry and decided to opine on the tastiness of ham. And, and so added a bit of wit and charm um, to others showing off their erudition. This poetry was left anonymous, but in other inscriptions, a writer might identify him or herself and, and give us a hint about who is actually participating in this activity, as we'll find happen in the theater district. So Pompeii has two theaters, a large theater and a small or covered theater. And between them and behind, there's a long corridor. So here's what the theater corridor looks like. And it's amazing that anything is still left on the walls because it's been exposed for so long, but there is. Um, so this corridor was another locus of gra for graffiti and personal names were popular to write here as they were in many locations in Pompeii. Um, and this is, an, this is an example of how Pompeii is full of surprises because I will show you here, we have not Latin and not Greek but we have a group of 12 signatures in Sapphietic, which is a South Semitic script and an old, um, er an old um, Arabic language, a, a dialect of old Arabic. And it was used by nomads in the area of Eastern Syria and Northern, what is now Northern Saudi Arabia. And this is the only example of Sapphietic in the entire Western Mediterranean. And it happens here in Pompeii. So, um, the writers may have come to Pompeii as traders passing through the main port of Italy nearby in Puteoli, or as my colleague Kyle Helms has recently proposed, they could have been auxiliaries in the Roman army. But this group of 12 signatures reminds us that visitors to Pompeii were also active in these spaces. We have another visitor who writes a prayer in this same spot in the corridor of the theater. Um, in this case, it's a female slave from the town of Attila, Attila, 50 kilometers away. So Methe here identifies herself with her name, the name of her owner, and her hometown. And then she offers a prayer to Venus, to Pompeian Venus, for the health of her relationship. So here we have someone who is outside the ruling class, but who knows how to follow the same contours of self-identification that we find in elite public monuments. So this inscription is a real treasure preserving as it does a personal expression of prayer. And in this instance, we know who the writer is, but can we tell anything about the reader? Well, the attended audience for the graffiti in the Basilica, they were clearly set up as showpieces. They were written clearly, legibly at eye level. Um, for Methe's prayer, we might assume the same. The prayer was posted for others read, others to read, but as we were documenting it in 2019, despite being written in a public space, okay, we're gonna zoom in on the yellow down at the end, and we end up with this, which even if you were to come up here, <laughs> um, there is an M right here, and there's an E and a T, and there's an a and an L. Um, this was never meant to be legible because its letters are less than three millimeters high. I don't know how someone had the, had the dexterity to write in such small letters. The other thing that reduces its legibility to others is that it's written out in an entire single line. 
if it were written in three or four lines that were kind of more bunched together, your eye would be able to take it in. But as you keep going across this very small writing, it's just impossible. So it's really, um, it's a really fascinating example. And it may be that it wasn't inscribed for others to read it, maybe just one um, audience, and that was Venus herself. So perhaps the importance here was not in the reading, but was in the writing. So we should not assume the same readership for all handwritten wall inscriptions, simply because they're all written on the same type of service, a wall. Um, but it is extremely challenging to assess other messages and analyze the impact of an inscription if you're not standing in front of it. So moving on to um, houses. And um, this, so we'll look just at two houses here. This certainly is a break from what is familiar to us in our world, in our own modern perspectives. Um, and in fact, in opposition to what Mao might have expected, the evidence from Pompeii illustrates that the most sumptuous houses are the locations for ancient graffiti. So, so if, if we're moving into an area with a more limited audience, does this change anything about what we find written in these spaces? Well, we're starting with the house of Maius Castricius, which is one of the wealthiest homes in Pompeii. And it stood at the Western edge of town and occupied some of the city's best real estate with views over the Bay of Naples. It was built into the city's fortification walls and stood four stories high and featured a private bath complex, a double peristyle and many reception rooms. The house was brought to light in the 1960s, which is how we still have any of the frescoes, which were painstakingly uh, pieced back together. In this house, we have the most heavily inscribed locations. You now can probably recognize your long live Augustus um, there. There's also a hallway, which is welcome. And those are in the vestibule. Um, it's all, we also have a concentration of graffiti in front of room seven and eight, which we'll look at in just a second. That's the main central reception room, the most highly appointed space. And then what we have there with five is a stairway leading up to more um, living space above. What we can see here um, in the background, maybe you see there's a roundel and that is a painting of Pompeii and Venus herself with lots, she's dripping with um, pearls and jewels. So this is a very important space. Um, and just outside of this space is where we have 18 graffiti, but they're very small. They're very discreet. They're tucked in and around the wall decoration. So if you can see up, I have a, a detail of the spiral candelabrum and Romula Wa, Romula greetings is right there, um, which suggests that um, the texts are able to blend more or less into their surroundings. It's easy to walk right past them. Indeed, one only notices them if you're already aware that they're there. The stairwell also gave us a concentration of graffiti. And because it's so hard to see them in a photograph, we'll do a line drawing. Um, several messages present multiple lines of text and their graffiti tend to respect each other, arranged more or less in two columns, one above the other. There's a lot of poetry here. And the verses include some of the most popular epigrams um, in Pompeii, but there's also a high level of originality. So starting at the top left, this incredibly popular couplet that begins Venomous Cupidi, we came here desiring, but now we really want to go, um, doesn't have the second line that we find elsewhere in Pompeii so that we can go home and see our lorries at Rome, but has an alternate version that says, but that girl holds back our feet. Um, so then we have Another well-known refrain, quis quis amat walia, and that's found all over Pompeii. Whoever loves, may they fare well, may they be strong, may they be well. But it's not um, standing on its own as it does in many other locations. It's here used as a concluding flourish for a different elegiac couplet that's not attested anywhere else in Pompeii. We have a verse of Lucretius um, and we have lots of other stuff on this wall. Um, 
the poetry inscribed here probably motivated the appending of additional verses, while the adaptations of popular epigrams may hint that there was a sort of one-upmanship in this ongoing conversation. This wall thus provides, provides us with one particularly literate example of graffiti inspiring and creating a conversation with each other. Then we'll turn to the House of the Fawn. How many people have been to Pompeii? Should have asked this at the beginning. How many people have ever heard of the House of the Fawn? Okay, if you go to Pompeii and you visit a house, it's probably this one. It's a really important one. Okay, here's our beautiful fawn. So um, with its unified architectural design, elegant painted decoration and elaborate mosaics, there was no house more impressive. This residence is enormous. It occupies an entire city block and a full 32,000 square feet. And it's just off the city center at the Forum. Um, yeah, it, you really can't overemphasize how important this house is. It was excavated from 1830 to 1832 and quickly became a favorite stopping point for visitors on the grand tour. The mosaics were a particular draw because they included Dun, dun, dun. the mosaic of Alexander the Great. Um, this was removed again to the Naples Archaeological Museum and it remains the centerpiece of the mosaic section. It's really fantastic. It's, it's, this doesn't do it justice, um, but there's a lot to say. It's extraordinary. Um, other mosaics are also impressive. So we have this uh, this is a massive one with all the fish um, and there are nine recognizable species of, of um, aquatic life in there. And then we have a fabulous baby Dionysus on a panther and I've made them small to fit them on a, on, on a single screen, but man, they're huge, but with really small tesserae. So these were just remarkable works of art. To balance out the fabulous floor decoration, we have this so-called first style of Pompeian wall painting, which was adopted from the architecture of public buildings. This was an opulent mode of decoration where stuccoed three-dimensional colored panels were painted to evoke exotic, expensive colored marble. So with this prominent and sumptuously decorated house of the Fawn, which communicated that its residents had been a leading family for a long time, where do we go? to gladiators because we, we couldn't skip gladiators, but I think finding them in the house of the fawn is really fabulous. So let's see what they tell us. Um, I'm gonna tell you that this sketch might not look like much, but let's see, let's see if we can figure out anything more about it. Um, so first, gladiators in the ancient world were the sports stars of their day. They were commemorated in mosaics, in paintings, on the funerary monuments of those who paid for their performances. This Zlitten mosaic offers a clear representation of gladiators fighting against opponents armed with different types of equipment. The pieces that each athlete carried, the long shield, the circular shield, the trident, the curved sword, these were each associated with a particular style of fighting. A successful gladiator required not only raw strength and stamina, but also strategic training to be able to outmaneuver an opponent whose equipment gave him distinct advantages. So you would pair them up differently. One, one would have offensive equipment, the other would have defensive equipment. Okay, a, glad, a gladiator would be trained in a specific style and gladiators self-identified through their lives with that style, as we find here. <laughs> so Kelidus is a Thracian, Crescanes is a Retiarius, and they both know that they're incredibly popular with the ladies, or so they say. Um, so in Pompeii, we can gauge popular reception of these athletes again, thanks to the graffiti. So hand sketched drawings of gladiators appear across Pompeii and are always careful to um, depict the specific type of equipment each gladiator carries. So you can see long, um, shield versus short shield versus round shield. Um, they, they're, it's like stats, I think. Um, so if we go back to our guys in the house of the font, we have four pieces of information. First are their names, Spicolus and Aptonatus. And we can tell from the equipment that they are carrying that Spicolus is a mermillo and Aptonatus has the curved sword of a Thracian. 
Then we have their record of wins. So we don't get wins and losses. We just get how many wins do they have? Because you don't want to have too many losses in Palm, or Palm Air or Rome, right? So, so Spicolus is a Tiro. He's a novice. This is his first time in the arena. Aptonatus has 16 wins. So he's a very accomplished gladiator. Now we have their status. Neronianus means that Spicolus was trained at the Imperial Gladiator Training School in Capua. So we got very specialized training. Aptonatus is really a special case because gladiators were slaves. They had to fight, but Aptonatus has won his freedom and he's, he's a libertus. He's, a, he's an ex-slave. He's a former slave. Um, he now has his freedom and it, it seems that he's entering um, the arena of his own will. And then lastly, oh, the outcome, which we can see communicated textually and visually. We weak it. Spicolus conquers and Aptonatus he perishes, um, which is not what always happened in Pompeii. Pompeii was not Rome. Pompeii was a smaller town. And um, we have many graffiti that show the conquered gladiator with an M, Missus Est. He was sent away to fight another day. So, um, but not in this case for Aptonatus. So, we don't hear anything more about Spicolus at Pompeii, but we do if we go to New York City and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where our Spicolus appears on a Roman glass cup. So the Romans were master craftsmen um, and they created souvenirs, including souvenirs of chariot races and of gladiatorial events. This cup depicts four gladiator matches and names each participant. The Romans produced plenty of generalized gladiator souvenirs, figurines, lamps, etc. But these glass cups celebrated a specific group. The gladiators must have truly been the celebrities of their day because more than 30 copies and versions of the cup have been um, found across the provinces of the empire in France and Germany and Britain. And the fame of these athletes are even referenced in the first century ancient novel of Petronius. The dinner host, in discussing his sil silver tableware, um, boasts about how he has cups, silver cups, showing the fights of Hermeros and Petrides. Petrides happens to be on the cups with Spiculus. Um, so as, as with much in the novel, Petronius takes something recognizable from daily life and then pushes it over the top. So Trimalchio has his cups in silver rather than glass. Um, and the joke may also be that he mistakes the gladiator pairing. Trimalchio has just been getting a lot of mythology wrong in talking about all of his decoration. If you know Trimalchio, you know Trimalchio. So it is likely that our Spicolus is this Spicolus because the graffito, the novel, the cups are all dated to the middle of the, the first century. And I think the fact that our Spicolus is a Neronianus lends further weight to him becoming the famous Spicolus because he would have had excellent training. And as a product of the gladiatorial training school, he would have been exhibited in many, a much wider number of venues than if he'd belonged to the troop of a private individual. So um, what may at first glance appear to be a simple sketch of gladiators, <laughs> in fact, give us, uh, gives us a lot more information when we can investigate it cross-disciplinarily. And it becomes a little more evident why someone may have sketched this drawing on the wall. We might ask if Spicolus actually performed in Pompeii or if the writer attended this event in another city. On that point, we cannot be sure, but what the details included here do show is the personal knowledge of the very first upset performance of a gladiator who would go on to become one of the most famous of his generation. Inscribed on the wall, this personal knowledge was then displayed and shared. Across the site of Pompeii, each house is different from another. We don't find the same thing written in every location. We don't find the same thing written in in any location, um, the graffiti in each building echo the conversations that were taking place in that space. 
But in many houses, both opulent and modest, we do find the presence of graffiti on the walls and a shared culture of communication in this first century Roman town. So altogether, the examples I've highlighted today are just, are just a few, but hopefully you've enjoyed the little variety that I've given you. Um, but they demonstrate the fallacy of ascribing graffiti to a single group, or, and certainly the mistake of writing them off entirely. Um, ancient graffiti differ significantly from their modern day counterparts. These are not the work of vandals or children, the two groups that modern, audience, modern audiences often assume. There's a little something more going on in Pompeii. So the houses of the Faun and Maius Castricius contain the echoes of discussions about poetry, composition, and the world of great athletes. The public spaces of Pompeii reflect individual urges to show off one's learning or one's cleverness, as well as personal sentiments such as the prayer of a slave for the continued care of a relationship or the signatures of sol soldiers passing through. From leading citizens to slaves, male and female, inhabitants and visitors to the town, members of all social classes engaged in writing and reading wall inscriptions. It can be challenging to unpack the clues sometimes, but when we recognize the full spectrum of participation and engagement, we cannot dismiss this material evidence and we should value the ability to engage in this written mode as the Romans themselves did. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can. Uh, yes, if you would like to ask a question, there is a portable speaking device <laughs> microphone. Um, and while you're coming up with your questions, I will quickly show you oh, that this is what the ancient graffiti project looks like if you want to look around and see what kind of graffiti are where in Pompeii or Herculaneum. You can click on locations, you can see what's there, you can see our photographs and see what they look like today, um, and you can go to featured graffiti and just have a more curated experience. So, yes, first question. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. How, how likely what, would it have been for a female slave to be able to read and write, or do you think Methe dictated it to someone to, to carve it for? So, so this is a question, and uh, when I first started talking about Methe, there was the response, clearly she did not write this. Um, and now the response is, how likely is did she write this? So I think in 15 years, we have, we have budged a little bit. Um, but slaves, um, enslaved populations, those who were working inside the home could be pretty, um, could, could have an education and do, do the writing for their um, owners. So we have her as, um, as Cominiais, so she's identifying a female owner and, and she could have been educated enough to write. Um, the thing that I do think we need to focus on is that she knows very clearly how to officially identify herself um, with, with multiple identifiers. So, so she understands the texted world in which she's operating when she's writing, when that prayer is being written. So it's kind of fantastic. I think she is, sorry, just really quickly, coming to um, Pompeii. Pompeian Venus was a special deity as associated with Pompeii. And so I think she is coming to Pompeii to write that prayer. But thank you. Yeah, I, I bring her up because she, she identifies herself. Yeah. Were there any graffiti uh, found yet that were of what we typically think of as our modern graffiti, that is, in some kind of paint or something rather than etched and carved? And secondly, um, there was some reference to some political messages besides celebrating the emperor. <laughs> was there any political life in the town? That is, uh, at a high level, obviously, everything was controlled through Rome. But was there local politics? Yes. And if there were local politics, does do they show up in graffiti? So they show up in Dipinti. Dipinti are uh, where we have about 3,000 um, notices for political candidates. 
So I'm taking us back to this wall to show you how many are here. So on this wall, we have Gaia, let me see. Uh, um, Dane, does this have a, a like laser pointer? Oh, there, okay, hold on. I'm, oh, okay, okay. Um, sorry for everyone online. I'm going to walk away from the microphone. Okay, so this is Gaius Laldius Foscus, who's running for Edile. Foscus, running for Edile. Um, <laughs> Caius Secundus, running for Duo Weir. Um, someone else up here, someone else here. Um, I can't remember who this guy is. This is Gaius Julius Olivius, running for Duo Weir. And all you really had to say is that he's worthy of serving in our, um, our government, our race publica. Um, he's worthy for the race publica. Vote for him. Um, <laughs> vote for him. Please vote for him. Um, but that's really all they say. So, so we do have a lot. There were elections every year annually, and you would elect four individuals to run a city like Pompeii. You'd had kind of two CEO mayors and two Ediles who were in charge of public works and games. Um, so we can we can figure out which families made it to the ruling class. Um, and then once you'd been elected, you were in the, the ordo. Um, in, so, so we have a very um, detailed slate of candidates. We don't have a lot of um, negative, right. We don't have a lot of negative because we don't have political parties, um, but they do have slates of candidates. Um, and there's just this one candidate that a certain group didn't like, and they started putting up fake um, campaign posters. And it would say the late night drinkers ask you to vote for Vatia and all the petty thieves want you to ask for Vatia. Um, so it's just poor Vatia is the one who like rubbed someone the wrong way and someone who had access to the painters who got them up. He's the, he's the only one. Um, there is there is one other graffito where someone talks about the Vibi having a lot of power, but um, spending time with their hands. So, yeah, there. Aaron can explain it to you if you want later. <laughs> um, yes, can we send? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, I just uh, quickly. I just had a question. How? Um. So going back to that map in the yes. graffiti project, how yeah. much of Pompeii is that already excavated out and how much is it left if you even have yeah. any idea? So about two thirds of Pompeii has been excavated and one third has been left um, uh, unexcavated and is actually generating revenue because um, they have tenant farmers working the land um, and that keeps things safe um, because it costs a lot to ha just have the maintenance to keep things up. But, but right now there is just kind of cleaning the edges um, which is revealing a tiny bit of good stuff. Thanks. How old was Pompeii when it was destroyed? And can you tell, you know, one graffiti is 50 years older than another or a hundred, you know? Yeah. So Pompeii had had a rich life by 79. Um, the geographer Strabo talks about the many different people who had inhabited Pompeii. So um, it becomes a Roman colony in 80 BCE. And so it lives its life as, as securely Latin um, for 160 years. Um, the prior link, the language spoken earlier was Oscan. And Oscan was spoken by the Samnites, the, the peoples who lived in central Italy and in kind of the, the Apennine range. Um, and so we have some painted inscriptions in Oscan that are thought to be marshalling stations saying kind of everyone in this area line up here because the city was besieged um, after as a result of the social war. And then it was kind of given an uh, it was planted with colonists to make it more loyal to Rome. Um, so the painted inscriptions in particular, we can tell that even though you do have um, whitewashing and kind of preparing the wall for new inscriptions for a new, um, a new 
electoral season, they didn't always do that. So we have some painted inscriptions that are from the, the from a hundred years earlier. Um, and we can tell because of the way there are ligatures um, and also um, sometimes vowel combinations haven't collapsed into long vowels yet. And even methe, in fact, is thought to be an early, um, yeah, an earlier, um, a, a first century BCE because utrace is an utrice yet and we want, yeah, is we want. So, so this is something from the very end of the Republic or the Augustan age at the, at the latest. Um, but we're, but we're working with kind of all of these contextual clues. There is a graffiti. There are a couple of graffiti that do say on this date and one is in the Basilica and it says Gaius Pumidius Diphilus was here, hake fuit, instead of he fuit, on this day in the year 80 BCE. So when these two guys were the consuls and it survived and that's how we date the Basilica. <laughs> um, so, but there are not many where people are giving a, a date. So for most of them, we assume it's the last 20 years of the, of the city. Um, fairly, so, so you'll be right next. So this gentleman is, is next after for the microphone. A, a fairly common type of graffiti, modern graffiti, yeah. is of course uh, obscene messages yes. on toilet walls and elsewhere. Yes. Uh, is there anything comparable in Pompeii? There is. <laughs> and someone else has already put up and taken care of publishing it. No, but I will say um, that it is kind of fascinating that that really is where our culture takes us because I, I think that the number of um, graffiti that use the term canidus or spado um, are right around the same number that use filicatare. So, um, so it's somewhere in the range of less than 5%. Um, yeah, like a couple, like 100, 120. Yeah, cool, yes. Um, what was the literacy rate? Do, do we know? I mean, these, these graffiti artists seem to be more literate than the current graffiti artists. <laughs> so that is, that is the big question. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that, so I, I also showed you the good stuff. Um, there are many inscriptions where people are writing their name. And I think they're very proud to be able to write their name. Um, and there are other inscriptions where people are writing their grocery list. Um, and that's kind of fantastic, even when we get to see how much things cost. Um, so, so this is a huge variety. Um, the, the literacy question is a, is a big one. And I think it's, it's still under discussion. Um, because yeah, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop there because th otherwise I'll just keep talking and no one will get to dinner if I, if I answer that one <laughs> at greater length. But I'll tell you, William Harris is a is a is a good point on the ancient literacy. Yeah, but oh, sorry. I think I, I can answer. No, I can answer these quickly. We've got two more questions. I have a question about contemporary graffiti and how. It's important for the graffiti artist to really have an artistic, a unique artistic style. And with the graffiti of this ancient world, was that similar? Like, did these inscribers really want to um, like cultivate a very distinct style in their writing? I will tell you, and so this is going to be the last one, if you can bring it up to this gentleman. Um, what is really fantastic is when we can see what the graffiti look like and we can see certain personalized signatures. So Lucilius loves his big L's, his little U's. And Lucilius is giving all sorts of greetings to Lucida. So she knows how to recognize him. Amianthus puts the A-N, no, puts the N-T-H all connected and he's cool. And he's sometimes calling himself Amianth. Um, just drop that us. So um, in a couple of examples, we can see that there really is a personalized style that has 
has arisen in the way that they're presenting themselves. Those are in public spaces. I don't think that people are really kind of um, creating that look in their houses. So thanks. The um, and Naples and its environment, which of course includes Pompeii, was founded by the Greeks, by the Greeks uh, as a Neapolis and a new place, new place to have a city state. Um, do you see any Greek in these um, in these graffiti? We do. We do have Greek. Um, we have pure Greek, and we sometimes have Latin Greek examples um, where the two languages are being mixed. Um, so there was one where there's an inscription advertising gladiatorial shows that will be hoop I throw. And it's written in Latin letters, hoop I throw, but it's a Greek hoop I throw under, yeah, under the sky, under the, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, but it will have meaning. It will have, um, Wela, what are they called? It will have, Sorry. Yeah. Um, well, no, it's it, it's Greek, but they're transliterating it, and so so there will be um, curtains curtains to protect you from the sun. Sorry, couldn't remember the English word. There are also sometimes uh, where people are writing their name in Latin and then writing it in Greek, um, and we do have. We do have, so there's this one interesting thing that people do in Greek that doesn't have a parallel in Latin. Um, the Greek letters of the alphabet can be associated with numbers. And so they'll write, the person that I love is number 531 in Greek. The whole thing is in Greek, but you know, like the 531 is phi mu epsilon or something. And then you've got to figure out who that is. So that, that always shows up in Greek. Um, and then we have, we do have, so we do have, I think it's about um, I think it's about eight percent of the graffiti in Pompeii are in Greek, and in Herculaneum it's closer to ten to twelve percent, but um, it's there. But again, they're still pretty short. Yeah. Yay. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>